Welcome to our first Tuesdays today. It looks like everyone has sound. If you're having any problems hearing, please send a chat message to let us know. Welcome to First Tuesdays. Um, with me today is Carolyn Peterson from the Washington State Library, and I'm Jennifer Fenton, and we are here to facilitate your session today. And we also have Jeremy with us. Jeremy is providing technical assistance. So if you are having any problems seeing or hearing what's happening, please give a shout out to Jeremy. You can either call him at that phone number there, or you can type in chat if you're able to get to the chat. It's brought to you by Washington State Library and the Institute of Museum and Library Services, our federal funding. So um, let's take a minute to make sure we have uh, attendance here. I know uh, we have Peter from Western Washington University and Diana from Snow Isle. Um, if everyone else can please type in chat where you're from, that will help us to um, track who attends this program. And I know Diane Huckabee is joining us from Ellensburg. And now it's my pleasure to turn this program over to our Washington Rural Heritage Digital Collection staff, Evan and Ross, will tell you what they've been up to lately. Please welcome Evan and Ross. Okay, can everyone hear me? I'm, I'm going to assume that you can. This is Evan Robb uh, from the Washington State Library. I'm here with Ross Fuquay, and this is us. And uh, we've been working on Washington Rural Heritage for uh, several years now. Um, the project started in 2007. Today we're going to um, just give you a quick overview of what the project is all about, um, give you a glimpse at the website and how, how to uh, navigate within the, the website, um, some of the advanced search functionality and some of the browsing functionality, and uh, show you a couple of highlights from recent grant projects and hopefully answer your questions if you've got any questions about um, potentially participating in the project um, or just using the collections um, or how these collections might re relate to your own digitization efforts um, within your own local institutions. So um, what is Washington Rural Heritage? Here are some um, images of materials from the collection that we recently did digitized. And so in one sense, Washington Rural Heritage is um, a standard digital collection of historical materials or uh, primary sources that are held in cultural institutions throughout the state. And um, if you've looked at, uh, at other states' um, digitization projects, you'll see a lot of collaborative digitization projects of this sort. For example, Montana Memory is a great example of that. Um, Arizona Memory Project is a great example of that. So Washington Rural Heritage is a, is a statewide digital repository of um, digitized collections from, from primarily libraries and museums throughout the state. Um, there's a lot of text on a few of these slides. Don't feel like you need to, to read any of this. It's too early in the morning for that. Um, we just want to make them re reusable uh, for people who are not able to, to view the, the presentation today. So we've been working since 2007 on helping libraries gather their histor historic materials and um, digitize them. And we provide, the Washington State Library provides the technical infrastructure to do that, to actually help digitize the material and put the material online by way of a digital repository. Um, a lot of the smallest libraries in, in the state uh, really face barriers when it comes to creating any sort of um, web presence for their, uh, especially for their historic materials, let alone electronic catalogs. Um, so in 2007, we decided we would try to begin serving the smallest public libraries in Washington State, helping them digitize some of those unique materials that are typically, you know, things like unpublished or minimally distributed local history documents, ephemera, um, things like photo collections, um, things of that nature, oral histories and put those online. Those are the sorts of things that are typically held behind the reference desk and, and see a lot of wear and tear over the years. And so the project has become an ongoing project of over 30 libraries throughout the state at this point. 
as well as their partnering institutions, which are frequently local museums and historical societies. And so our mission is to enable them to create digital collections that highlight their local history, uh, to make them uh, available to an online audience, and to provide long-term storage of their digital masters. So in addition to helping libraries digitize material, we do provide long-term backup of their uh, their digital master files. And we do that here at the Washington State Library, back up on our, our servers and through optical media. We still do that. We use DVDs. And we also um, outsource some of that preservation work to OCLC. So we send uh, digital masters to OCLC. And the State Library pays for all of that. And so since 2007, we've launched 25 digital collections. Um, we just finished up our fifth grant cycle, fifth annual grant cycle this year. And uh, starting in 2013, in just a, a couple months, we'll be announcing our, our sixth grant cycle. Um, altogether, we've partnered with uh, over 80 cultural heritage institutions or historic institutions. So 30 of those, about 30 of those are libraries. And the libraries partner with other organizations um, in their communities. Usually it's museums. It's, sometimes it's uh, local uh, churches, um, local schools, such as high schools, et cetera, uh, other nonprofit organizations. And uh, what has come out of that is also a great deal of community involvement. So there's, there's been a participatory history element of this project that was sort of unanticipated from at the beginning. And um, so libraries are, are serving in a leadership role to help digitize material held in private family collections, usually family collections, um, from local communities. And uh, we've, we've gotten uh, over 200 community members throughout the state have um, actually submitted material for digitization with the help of the libraries um, that, are, that are partnering with Washington Rural Heritage. So we've, worked, we've got over 12,000 unique digitized resources that were hand digitized by um, library staffers throughout the state. At last count, we've, we've taught about 75 library staffers how to digitize material to uh, nationally recognized standards. Um, and that comprises about 20,000 individual electronic files altogether. And over the five years or so that we've been giving out grants, we've, we've given out about uh, $260,000 in, in grant funding. Every, we, every year we give out um, $50,000 in grant funding with a maximum of $10,000 total. And uh, we, have, we have gotten over a million item views since mid-2009. Um, so there's a great deal of um, a great deal of use of these collections. The, the, our, our digital repository is, is crawled by Google and all of the major search engines, and that is really where most of our, our traffic comes, comes through. Uh, so here are just a few of our participants. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Ross now so that he can tell you a little bit more about eligibility for participating in the project. OK. Uh, thanks, Evan. Um, I'm assuming everybody can hear me. Please uh, let us know if you can't. But my name is Ross Fuquay, and um, I am the uh, I'm a digital projects librarian working uh, specifically on the Washington Rural Heritage Initiative. Um, I've been at the State Library and working with Evan on Washington Rural Heritage for for about a year and a half. So by the State Library standards, I'm I'm still very much the new guy um, on the block, and I've been, you know, able to to learn a lot. But um, it's just been a fabulous project to work on, and to to get to know a lot of uh, a lot of you who are working out in smaller libraries across the state. It's been very fun. Um, but as uh, yeah, as Evan said, I'm just gonna kind of go through um, what our subgrants look like. Um, and the, the sub, we call them subgrants because they are subgrants of of our grant that the state library receives uh, each year from the in Institute of uh, Museum and Library Services. And um, so the Washington Rural Heritage pro Project as a granting project awards subgrants. And um, 
So just to kind of get into some of the specifics, it's an annual grant cycle. Uh, we set it, the state library sets aside 50000 a year, um, specifically for Washington Rural Heritage Projects. Um, and, and that is divvied up to, divvied into uh, grants of up to $10,000 per uh, library per grant cycle. Um, so those are available on a, it's, it's a competitive application basis. Um, usually in the, the late uh, winter, we'll open up the, uh, the grant application. Um, so you, uh, you have a couple of months, usually six to eight weeks, I think, um, at least to uh, complete materials and submit them by, it's usually about mid-April is um, typically when our, when our deadline is for these grants. Uh, you, must be, you must be submitting the grant from um, either a public or a tribal library in the state of Washington. And your library must serve a, a population of 25,000 or fewer people. Um, now, uh, if you're a branch library within a larger system, um, within a regional, you know, countywide or multi-county system, uh, but your branch's service population is below 25,000, you're still eligible and still very welcome and encouraged to apply for these grants. Uh, excuse me. Um, and while the, <coughs> excuse me, while the libraries serve as um, kind of the project coordinator for these digi uh, digitization projects, and they serve as the fiscal agent for the grant, um, the libraries, the, the collections that you uh, work with and digitize over the course of a grant cycle, as Evan was saying earlier, uh, those collections don't have to be a part of your, your own library's collection. You can partner with uh, a, a museum or a cultural institution or a nonprofit in your community or just simply individuals, you know, who are, who have good material and who are willing to, um, to share those to build a digital collection. Um, so by by no means um, do you have to be kind of stuck, you know, working with your own materials. Um, and then um, kind of the minimum thing that we ask of the subgrantees um, who are you know working on a on a grant is that you digitize and catalog to um, our specifications a minimum of a hundred unique uh, resources or items during that grant cycle. And usually that's that's a pretty pretty doable um, uh, number for folks to to hit. And in fact, a lot of our projects have have digitized several hundred items over the course of a year. Uh, okay, so what what can you use the funds for? Um, you can use them to purchase uh, software that you'll need for optimizing images. Um, most folks go with some kind of uh, iteration of Adobe Photoshop. Um, we're seeing a, more, more and more people go with Photoshop Elements, which is an actu actually a really powerful and affordable um, version that we think is, you know, will, it will get you through uh, a digitization project uh, really well. Uh, you can also use it to buy uh, peripheral hardware, meaning, you know, a flatbed scanner um, for your library, uh, external hard drive. Um, the main thing that you can't use these grant funds for, because they're coming from uh, the federal uh, MLIS, is uh, you, c you cannot use them for, you know, to buy a device that has internet connectivity um, due to CEPA reg regulations. Um, the other main thing that grant funds typically go towards is to pay, pay local contractors or to pay for extra, to provide extra hours to part-time staff at your library um, to, actual to carry out the actual work um, during the course of the year. And that's typically what we see most of um, a typical grant cycles funds go towards. Um, and you, of course, can also use the funds, and we encourage you to use at least a portion of the funds to promote your collection at the end of your um, at the end of your project. There's a, just a note. There's a link to um, 
our LSTA grants down here at the bottom. But uh, just you know, a quick a quick note about promoting your collections. This um, this photo is so cool. Uh, we took this photo back in June, and uh, this is a, a billboard. Uh, on Highway 12, just east of Pomeroy, Washington, out in Garfield County, and um, uh, the librarian there, Lillian Heitfeld, who some of you may know or be familiar with, um, worked with a uh, a local um, organization there who wanted to provide the library with some some in-kind advertising, and so she was able to get this billboard. And I, I believe it was about like six months of, you know, paid ad space on this billboard. And she decided to use it to promote her uh, rural heritage project. So we thought that was really, really awesome. Uh, and the other thing we want to mention and stress is that you don't, you absolutely don't need to be um, a recipient of a rural heritage subgrant to participate or to contribute material or to set up uh, your own digital collection with this project. We're, we're here to serve small and rural libraries throughout the state. And um, we, can, we can work on you, work with you um, if you're interested in having us come out and uh, you know, spend a day or two digitizing a small uh, portion of, of local items. We can help you kind of test the waters and see you know, see how these uh, how it all works, and, and it, it would this kind of gives libraries a sense of what they might be getting into um, should they apply for a grant uh, in subsequent years. And so, what we do, um, what Evan and I do, uh, we provide training throughout the year. Uh, we help folks kind of negotiate. Um, digitization and cataloging guidelines and best practices and help you kind of uh, translate those and, and adapt those to um, your local collections. Uh, as Evan said earlier, we provide the, the infrastructure and uh, the content management system uh, which serves up the collection to the general public. Uh, we we also um, from time to time will come out and we have some we have some pretty cool things for digitizing uh, three-dimensional objects or oversized uh, two-dimensional objects that we can help you with that, you know, things that aren't easily digitized um, on your kind of run-of-the-mill flatbed scanner. Uh, we, can, we can come out for a couple of days and, and help you, you know, digitize objects in the collection and things like that. And then as Evan said earlier too, um, we're also, you know, serving um, or try, trying to trying to meet the needs of of providing long term um, backup and distribute distributed uh, you know preservation strategies. Um, and uh, this is um, this is a, a screenshot of a little piece of software that's part of Content VM that um, is it. Participants' main cataloging tool. Um, once you have digitized your items, we can uh, import derivatives to the server, and then with this little piece of software called Project Client that will come out and install locally, um, you can you can use it. And so it's very, I think, user friendly. You know, gives you a little thumbnail to go through, and um, gives you access to our controlled vocabularies. Um, to to do the descriptive cataloging um, on your collection, and then once you've once you've finished um, filling out metadata for items, you can upload that metadata to our server, and that goes through uh, an approval queue that Evan and I can kind of go through and spot check and um, work with you and give you feedback on on your metadata creation throughout the process. And once we approve it, your metadata goes to the server and um, is is there and publicly accessible. And so this is um, this little cheesy little graphic I put together is um, kind of 
meant to give you an idea of what a project, um, kind of like an annual project life cycle looks like. Uh, at the top, you know, you'll kind of be selecting material um, or say material comes to you from an individual or someone in your community. Um, we, we also provide, at the start of each grant cycle, um, we provide a two-day, fairly intensive online copyright training um, that's typically led. We usually contract with um, a training vendor like Amigos for that who will um, you know, work with us to set up a, a presenter who, who is um, you know, trained both in library and information science and uh, has a law degree. And so we'll, we'll ask that all the sub-guarantees participate in that copyright training, uh, which happens usually in mid-September. And that gives you a really, hopefully, what that gives you is a, a very good understanding of how to, how to negotiate um, determining the copyright status of, of things that you want to put into your collection. And then from there, um, you'll, you'll work to actually create your digital objects um, from, from the analog. Uh, you'll take those master files and create what are called derivative files um, meant for uh, web accessibility. So, and typically that means you're taking like a TIFF file, which is an, a very large uncompressed image file and converting it to a JPEG or a JPEG 2000, something that will, um, that can travel over the interwebs very quickly. And um, once you've digitized your things, uh, you'll actually send your, send your derivative files and your master files to us. We kind of accession them um, in our system. We get them onto our server and we start the process of of, of packaging them up to um, packaging up the, your master uh, preservation files to send um, to OCLC. But then we can also put your web derivatives online and you'll you know quickly be able to access those, bring those into your project client um, to, to carry out descriptive cataloging. And then once we once we um, to help launch your collection, we try to help, you know, help libraries uh, promote your collection as best we can. Usually um, most of that happens through social media, but um, as you've, have you've seen with Lillian's billboard, you know, people, people get creative with promoting their digital collections. So that's typically what, um, what a year in the life of a rural heritage project looks like. And I think, I think at this point, I need to hand it back over to Evan. And Evan's going to walk you through um, uh, our, our fairly new, new as of, of March, um, iteration of Constant DM. OK, yes. Yeah, so I'm, um, I'm going to see if I can share my browser with you. And um, show you exactly what the website looks like in, in real time. So let's see if I can do that effectively here. This can be a little slow, so let me know if um, if it's not working for you. This should not be up just yet. And if anybody has any questions as we're going through this, please let me know by asking your question in the, the chat box. I'll try to notice that. OK. Um, can somebody? Uh, like Ross, can you let me know whether or not you're seeing the home page for Washington Rural Heritage? Okay, great. So this is the home page for Washington Rural Heritage. I'll try to move things, my, move my cursor slowly here so that there's not too much of a lag. Um, at the top here you see a search box and this is where you 
you would search on the on the collection if you just would like to search across all 25 of the collections that are currently published. And um, you can also perform an advanced search, and we'll take a look at that in a minute here. Um, on the home page, you can also explore by the actual collection. So these are the list. Uh, this is a list of the 25 collections. And you could search by the contributing institution. So if you select any of these um, items from the drop-down menu, you'll perform a search only on that institution's material. So if I were to click on the Catholic Public Library um, material, I would only see their material come up in my search results. Um, you can search by format. So we have images. Um, we have documents. We have photos of objects and artifacts. We have some audio and, and very little video. We're going to have more video in this coming year with a, a few of our current grant projects. And you can also search by date. And we've got that broken down by decade, starting as early as 1860, almost to the present day. And actually, we should probably update that. I think we have some material from the, the 2000s at this point. Um, and you can also see, uh, you can also search by current projects on the map. So you can click on any of these projects to take you to their specific collection. So in other words, you can search on the entire repository at once. And I'll show you what that looks like. Let's search on horses. And that brings up 810 results um, with horses somewhere in the record. Now, when we performed that search, we searched on horses anywhere in any of the fields, uh, including descriptions and titles and subject fields. And we can, we can refine that so that we're only searching on specific fields. Before we do that, though, let's actually go and take a look at a specific sub-collection. So I'm going to take you to one that was recently published um, just last year as its grant project. And this is from the, the Connell branch of Mid-Columbia Libraries. Um, so the Connell Heritage Collection has its own landing page. And you can see in the, uh, the top left, a carousel of images that are randomly selected from the, the collection. This is something that's sort of an out-of-the-box feature of, of Content DM, and I think we're going to be looking at swapping that out for something a little bit um, more, more relevant. Um, for example, soon we'll be able to point to the most, most highly rated or popular um, items within a collection. I think we'll probably um, point to those there. Um, below that is a short description of the collection. And below that are additional drop-down menus so that you can search within the collection. So if you um, click on this drop-down menu, you can see uh, the various sub-collections within Connell Heritage. So we have material from the Connell Heritage Museum, the library, uh, the local newspaper, as well as privately owned material um, from that community. Uh, so they digitize material from three different organizations and family collections for their grant project. Um, below that are some suggested topics. And these are created by you if you're working on a grant project in collaboration with us. We kind of decide, uh, well, what topics are interesting to, to your users and uh, what would you like to you know, shine a spotlight on? And we can create custom searches for those. So those will each perform a search on the collection. Um, at the top right are uh, recent updates for this collection. So these are, these are the most recent additions to the collection. And you can sign up for an RSS feed if, you, if you're an RSS uh, user. Not many, not many of your library patrons are going to be RSS users, but it's a great way for you to keep track of um, uh, content that you find interesting or to keep track of your own library's content That's if they're working on digital collections. Um, I, I subscribe to all, all of these for the, the project, and um, it's a good way for me to keep track of what is being uh, uploaded and approved, um, because Ross is doing a lot of that approval, um, and, and vice versa. So we both keep track of, of new material coming into the collection that's being uploaded periodically that way. And I'm sure you have your, your local history buffs and power users who are still using uh, RSS feeds for that sort of thing. Um, at the very top right is a drop-down menu, and this allows you to navigate out back out to other sub-collections. And this is just an easier way to, to navigate throughout the, throughout the entire site. 
So let's actually perform, um, well actually first let's, let's click on browse all. I've been talking about the, the landing page, but you probably just want to see the stuff. So I'm going to click on browse all, and this performs a search on the entire collection. So Connell Heritage has 202 cataloged resources, and um, you can see all of those here. At left, you see that Connell Heritage is at the top of this list of other collections, and it's the only one that's checked. So if you wanted to add additional collections um, and browse those at the same time, you could. So, for example, a Soton County Heritage is, is not that far uh, removed in, geographically from Connell, so you could add this to your, to your uh, search and, and view the, the content combined. You can also narrow this, this search, so we're looking at everything in the collection, and you can say, well, I only want to look at still images, and that makes up the, the vast majority of this collection. Um, so you could click on still image. I'll do that right now. And that will just um, show us just the, the visual resources in the collection. You can click on contributing institution and select from that content. So Franklin County Graphic makes up a large portion of this collection. And that will show you only material from the, the local newspaper, the Franklin County Graphic. And then you can um, search by subjects that are shown in, in these items that are uh, part of this part of this actual search result um, set. You can search by the date. And uh, you can also, that those suggested topics from the landing page are also present on this page. You can search um, in the search box at the top here, you can search within, re within these results, or you can create a new search. So let's create a new search. Um, and let's search on uh, fire. I know that there were some fires in uh, Connell history. Um, so that is a search on fire. And some of these are obviously about fires. You can tell that by the, um, by the title. Some of these are probably less obviously about fires when, within the, uh, the community's history or only make a brief um, brief comment on, on, on that event. So I'm going to click on this item. And you should be able to see the item level record at this point. This panning may show up really slowly on your end of things. So this is an item level record. And you can zoom in. Um, right now we're at 25% of the maximum zoom level. And you can zoom into 100% and pan around the image. And, and keep in mind, this is, this is still not the, uh, the highest quality image available. This is actually a, a compressed JPEG version of your master file. Your master files are, are much too large to, um, to deliver to your, your audience online. Um, but, you know, your audience can contact you and ask for a master file if they have a uh, uh, need for one. At the top of this record, there's a, a link for a reference URL. So if you wanted to send somebody the link by email, you would click on that and you can copy and paste this. You can embed the object in, uh, as HTML into a website as well. Uh, this is a little widget for sharing via a uh, number of social media. So if you wanted to share this on your Facebook page, it's as simple as clicking right here. Uh, you can add tags to items, and you can also add comments to items. And we'll take a look at what one of those comments look like. You can also rate items. So I'm going to rate this right now. I, I'd give this three stars, for example. And I get a little message saying my rating was saved. Was saved. And so that becomes a permanent part of the record. Um, you can save to favorites. I'll show you that briefly. Uh, and you can print and download a copy of, of this um, access file. So if you click on download, you can click, uh, you can select a small, medium, or large version of the image. A small would be sort of thumbnail size, uh, slightly larger. And a, a large version would be essentially the same size that you see here at 100%. If you scroll down beneath the image, 
you'll actually see the record. And so this is the actual cataloging being performed um, by folks that are working on Washington Rural Heritage Collections. And these, these records are actually hyperlinked as well. So um, fire as a subject term is hy hyperlinked. So you can search, you can click on this and it will take you, it will perform a new search for you on the subject term fire within the collection. You can search on date. So if you will only want to see records that um, are from 1905, you can do that. And down below here is where any tags or comments would show up for the record. And for this particular item, there are none. Now, I just received uh, an alert telling me that uh, we had gotten a, a new comment on an item in Connell Heritage two days ago, and that was for a, a baseball team photo. So I'm going to click on this search and see if I can find it for you. I think it was this one. Let's take a look. So here's the image. It's of a baseball team, a group portrait. If we scroll down, here is the comment. Um, it, and somebody has said, well, somebody named Megan Harris McKinley has said, I believe it is Clyde Harris on the end of the front right row. And this has been uh, the, the major, the, the primary use we've seen of commenting in these collections, identification of unidentified people and places, which is fantastic. Um, and we've gotten, uh, for Connell Heritage, about 20 or 25 comments of that sort from a number of different people. And that's all because the, the local library has actually actively solicited comments from people, letting them know that they can leave those comments. And um, as those comments come in, the library can decide whether or not to add those comments or some of the information from the comments into the, the permanent record for that item. So let's perform an advanced search within Connell Heritage. And I'm going to search on, well, I'm going to select all of the words fire within the subject field. That only gives me four results. So four items had fire in the subject field. Let's add to that search. So I'm going to create sort of a, a, a Boolean search here by changing this to or, adding another field, searching on floods, also in the subject field, and clicking search. And that brings up 34 results. Um, showing fires and floods in the Connell area or the Con Connell Heritage Collection. And now if we look at this first row, we see um, a lot of those took place at the turn of the 20th century, but then we have more material that's from the 1950s. And we can narrow this further uh, by date. So I'm going to click on search by date. And uh, I, I only want to see material from the 1950s. So I'm going to type in 1950 to 1959. And that further refines my results to 26 results. And I can X out of that particular um, part of the search by just Xing here. And it will just, again, show me fire and floods um, from throughout the collection. Now, the great aspect of, um, of aggregating all of these disparate collections from throughout the state is that um, you can you can search on multiple collections at once, as I, I mentioned earlier. So Connell is not too far from Whitman County. Uh, let's see if uh, if there were any uh, floods, notable floods in Whitman County. I happen to know there there were. So I'm going to add Whitman County to this search, and I'll also add oh Columbia County. That's right next to Franklin County, and click OK. And that brings up 127 results of, on the subject uh, fire or the subject floods. And so this is an interesting way to um, compare collections. You see, when I did that search, that um, the search interface defaulted to Washington Rural Heritage in the, the banner image. And that just shows you that now you're searching on the entire repository rather than just the Connell Heritage part of the repository or whatever subcollection you were originally searching in. And so that kind of gives you a, a, a general overview of 
how you would browse throughout a collection and search within a collection. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Ross to show you some of our uh, interesting use of coordinates, latitude and longitude coordinates, uh, georeference material, uh, and, and, uh, and creating maps to, to better navigate through the collection. Okay. So let me see if I can share my uh, browser with you guys. This will probably take a minute, so bear with me here. OK. Can you all see my, my browser? Are you, are you seeing the home page here? Yes. Great. I can see it. it uh, Ross is on a laptop, uh, so the pixel dimensions or the, the aspect ratio may be a little bit smaller, but I think he'll still be able to see what he's doing. Okay, cool. Um, so this is um, this is a map of um, all of the 25, 2600 items that we now have um, uh, some kind of um, finite and specific uh, latitude and longitudinal coordinates for. Um, and we've been when we when we upgraded uh, to Contendium version six earlier this year, back in I think it was February or March. Um, from from the previous version, we we found that we were going to have to seriously rethink how we were we were creating our um, our maps to provide you know kind of this geographical browsing feature of our collections. Um, so I was doing some research and I found um, a super handy tool. I would encourage you know librarians anywhere to play play around with it. Uh, if you have a Google account, uh, it's called Fusion Tables, and you can find it under uh, Google Drive, what used to be called Google Documents. Um, it's technically still kind of a beta or experimental project of, of Google Drive, but it essentially al allows you to import um, data that's more or less like in spreadsheet form. And it doesn't have to be geographical data. It could be any kind of like statistical data, and it's it's a it's a visualization tool um, for either putting your data up on maps or creating charts, um, you know, quick charts or graphs. So anyway, that's what's driving all of our maps right now is um, essentially a, a fancy spreadsheet on um, on Google Drive, and um, it's been it's been really neat to kind of integrate. Uh, we have created this kind of custom info window. Uh, hopefully, you can you guys can all see this uh, info window on uh, this item in the Lake Chelan area. Um, but you know, this has allowed us to create these hyperlinks to um, to give you further access to stuff in this collection. So, for instance, we're looking at um, an image on, that's been put on the map uh, called Old Man Grover's Place, Hog Scalding. Um, and this is from the Gathering Our Voice collection. So if you click on this, and we have this opening a, a separate tab, um, this brings you to that entire subcollection within uh, North Central Washington Heritage. Um, and then if we have, and I'm not sure if we have multiple items at this specific location, but that's, yeah, we just have, we just have the one. But um, these, these are all essentially um, uh, search, search queries um, in this info, info box. So any, you know, any, anything you want to kind of um, browse about um, based on, on location, you can, you can kind of get get into the collections this way. So this is the main map um, that we've created for, um, for we, we're aggregating all of the georeferenced items from across the state in this map. But um, each individual collection has its own map page, which you know is zoomed in further. It kind of uh, gives you a bit more detail from the start. Um, Sorry about that. And you know, it just makes things a bit more local. So you can really zoom in here. Uh, if you, if you want to zoom in as far as you can, you can 
take this terrain option off of the maps or go to the satellite feature and you know this this acts just like a Google map would um, so yeah so that was you know we we've made that as is kind of a uh, the main browse feature for people who are kind of geographically oriented and who want to explore collections that way. Um, and let's see, we have a couple of other things that we're using. Um, another tool for a tool that was developed at the Library of Congress called um, ViewShare. And ViewShare is actually, the functionality is very, very similar to uh, what you're able to do with it is very similar to what you can do with fusion tables. Um, but it's just kind of a different, slightly different um, tool. It kind of it works with a different um, map based layer. And we've been using that primarily on the Ellensburg Heritage Collection to, um, to create, you know, different browse points. Uh, for folks to explore the Allensburg collection. So this is a map that um, Evan created using the ViewShare tool. And um, as you can see, you know, each each item that's geo-referenced gives you a thumbnail with a or an info box with a thumbnail and some basic um, some basic metadata that'll lead you into the collection. And then um, Oh, I want to, uh, Evan, should I show that explore page real quick? Sure. Is that just? That's, our, is that that's the link explore? below the, uh, oh, yeah, there it is. Yeah, and um, so this is another uh, kind of, um, um, Tool, tool Evans uh, put together for for browsing um, featured content, just stuff that we think is cool. Um, again, using the Library of Congress's ViewShare tool, and you can you can click through and kind of get different. Um, you know, you can just kind of browse stuff in different ways here. You can get a map. I like this gallery view. It kind of you know gives a person a, a thumbnail with a, a link to. Um, uh, to specific items relating to to that little ga gallery. All right. Okay. So where are we? Um, and I also just um, I wanted to mention that um, the the all of the cataloging that you spend all of this time on is reusable, and that's one of the great things about having this digital repository software that is is easy to export all the, the metadata from. So in Ellensburg, uh, the Ellensburg Public Library has done a fantastic job of geo-referencing hundreds of their of their uh, items in their collection, and that was why we were able to create that fantastic map of barns throughout uh, Kittitas County. Um, we were then contacted recently by somebody, a, a local GIS um, specialist, um, a private, small private company that is under contract with the Kittitas uh, County Chamber of Commerce, and she asked for the collection metadata. It's it's public data, so I was able to give that to her, and uh, she was able to integrate that with with uh, an additional map with uh, that incorporated. Ellensburg Heritage Collections from the Ellensburg Public Library with all other types of historic and uh, contemporary um, information related to recreational opportunities throughout Kittitas County. And that map is now available on, on the uh, Kittitas County Chamber of Commerce website. Um, so it was a really nice reuse of, of all of this um, metadata that was you know, uh, lovingly and laboriously created by the folks that were working on the project at the Ellensburg Public Library. So it, it's there. It, there are the possibilities for reusing this information are, are really endless. Um, and I didn't really plan to to mention this. I just want to show you um, one other aspect of the collection, and that is the fact that we can crosswalk. Um, records from these collections, these digital collections, to WorldCat. Um, so here's an example from the San Juan Island Heritage Collection. 
we crosswalked these records from our content DM, content DM repository in Dublin Core format, which is kind of a loosey-goosey uh, meta metadata format, to MARC, which is a lot stricter. Um, and so we've made them into to MARC records. And these are actually not just visible in WorldCat, but they're um, in, in the local catalog for the San Juan Island Library District. And we're in the process of of making all of our records available through WorldCat or you know, available as MARC records to our participating libraries. So that's another part of the project. So you, and that really you know, enables your local patrons who are searching your catalog to find this material uh, through you know, yet another platform. They don't have to know about the Washington Rural Heritage website and go to it. Um, they can find it just by searching it uh, you know, on the OPAC. Um, and before we finish up here, I just wanted to uh, highlight a few of the recent projects from 2011. I'm going to, to go through these pretty quickly because I want to leave some time for questions. And we'll, we'll send you a, um, a copy of all of these slides with, with links. So here are some highlights from 2011-2012. Um, all, of, all of the projects that we just recently finished up working on in, as of August. Um, the North Central Washington Heritage Collection, Ross mentioned that. That was a collaboration primarily between North Central Regional Library and a nonprofit based in Wenatchee called the Initiative for Rural Innovation and Stewardship. And uh, they're a nonprofit focused on local food economies and agriculture and uh, advocating for local uh, and sustainable agriculture. And uh, so North Central Washington, uh, North Central Regional Library and IRIS, uh, as Initiative for Rural Innovation and Stewardship is known, partnered to digitize material focusing on agriculture, food production, food storage, and food distribution throughout all of the five counties that make up uh, NCRL's territory. And so they, um, they actually ha held five photo drives at five libraries in, from NCRL um, over the course of several months and did a lot of publicity letting people know that they were doing these photo drives. And so um, they actually had scanners on hand at these events. People came in with their, their privately held material and um, it was digitized and put online. And in addition to private collections, some of the local historical societies that you see at the bottom of the slide um, came out and contributed some of their material. So uh, it, it became a really uh, great little sub-collection that features uh, food production from throughout that part of the state. So that was a really great um, a partnership. Uh, Connell Heritage, which, which I mentioned before, was the Connell branch of Mid-Columbia Libraries partnering with the local museum and the local newspaper. Also the, uh, the Connell Downtown Development Association. So part of that project involved um, photographing um, present day um, murals on the side, painted on the sides of buildings. And we actually just went out and, uh, and did some photography with a, a high quality DSLR camera for those. Uh, Connell Heritage was really great because they were able to collaborate with other um, small branches within Mid-Columbia Libraries at Benton City and at Prosser who had already crea uh, created digital collections and, and had a lot of knowledge to share as well as equipment. So that was a great example of collaboration. And uh, then Odessa Heritage, Odessa Public Library in this case in Lincoln County partnered with the local museum. Historiches, I think I'm saying that correctly, is, is German for historical museum. And um, they, part, they digitize a great deal of, inf of uh, resources from the, the museum's collection. They also digitize material from local community collections. And they had the, the uh, local Odessa high school class do a lot of the descriptive work and the research work on this project. Um, including uh, the production of, well, actually, the, the, the one of the high school classes went out and interviewed uh, longtime residents that were now living in assisted living facilities in Odessa and did a short um, 
oral history on a specific community hall building in in the uh, in the town, and they recorded these reminiscences of of uh, all of early events in the community hall building, and that became um, you know a written report that is now part of the collection as well. So there's historic material, and there's a little bit of contemporary material that adds to, to the context um, uh, of the existing material. And so those are just a few of the highlights of last year's project. Maybe it will give you an idea for the types of digitization projects that you can do in your in your local community. Um, I, that pretty much wraps it up. Does anybody have any questions? And if if you if you do, feel free to ask them. Um, if if not, definitely send us an email, and we'd be glad to to uh, answer any questions you have. Thanks, Evan and Ross. Yes, please. Uh, ask questions, and while you are typing in your questions, uh, Carolyn has an announcement about January. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, January is going to be a good one, uh, and the reason is that I think some of us always get burnout, you know, in the holidays. We do too much. We, we just, oh, you know, we try to accomplish everything, and by the time we stagger back to work, we're just, you know, really <laughs> low and depleted, and so January's um, session is a good one because it'll, uh, it'll help us avoid the same mistake next next time. What she's, um, what Deborah Westwood, who is a library cluster manager at King County Library System, is going to do is give us some strategies in this interactive session for avoiding burnout. Um, she says that, um, you know, we all react to stress in different ways, and so she's going to help us in this program devise some strategies to avoid this, to avoid, you know, our work life is changing so fast and so furiously that she has developed these techniques in her own work at uh, King County Library to help staff deal with the constant change that new technology, um, demographics, and uh, you know just stresses at work provide. So she's going to help us out to avoid burnout. So we hope that uh, many of you will take advantage of this good opportunity on January 8th. Thank you, Carolyn. And all right, any questions for Evan or Ross? Um, could you reiterate when you think you're going to set the, um, when you will announce the next grant cycle? Oh yeah, that would be a good idea, wouldn't it? Um, usually we announce the, that the material is available online at the very end of February, um, and then Grant applicants have about two months to put together their applications. So they have uh, through March and April, and typically the last Friday in April is, is when the applications are due. And um, at that point, we spend um, all of May, well, we, we convene uh, a scoring committee uh, com comprised of members of the uh, library and archives community. Uh, locally and from other institutions to score the applications. That happens throughout May. And then uh, by mid-June, we have actually decided on, on grant awards. And so that's that's typically when people find out they, they have received an award or not. OK, another question. Are you willing to have people ask you questions uh, leading up to the grant application? Oh, applica absolutely. We want to hear from people asking questions about what is or what is not appropriate, you know, asking for recommendations. That's what we're here for. We, we would rather actually, you know, um, have people ask us as many questions as they can possibly think of than, than not hear from them at all. So yes. We do, um, you know, we, we provide these guidelines to the grants online, but it can be a lot to, to absorb. So we're certainly, th they're here to, to help um, interpret those. I see Carlotta is, is typing from Whitman, not Whitman, Walla Walla Rural Library District. And Diane is typing something.